Alright, if you are a mother, raise your hand up high and proud. I see many hands all across this room. If you would like to be a mother one day, raise your hand up. If you are, if you had a mother, raise your hand up. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise for all of our mothers. All right, church family, take your copy of God's Word and join me today in the book of Acts chapter 16. The book of Acts chapter 16. Our sermon for today is titled, Learning from Lydia, a Mother's Day Message. Acts chapter 16. Hope you have your Bibles, open those up. Also in your worship bulletin, if you open those up. There is a sermon note section, so you can write down some notes from today. Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 11, God's Word says this, Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia. A colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to a woman who we met there, a certain woman named, everyone say, Lydia. Lydia. Heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and now the preaching of His Word. I have heard that Mother's Day is the third most celebrated holiday worldwide behind only Christmas and Easter. Well, over 100 years ago, by an act of Congress, then-President Woodrow Wilson proclaimed the second Sunday in May as Mother's Day he established it as a time for public expression of our love and reverence for the mothers of our country. And I think it aligns well with the biblical principles and mandates that we are to honor our parents, that we are to recognize those whom God used to give us physical life. So today we honor the mothers inside of this church family. The Hebrew word for mother is ame. It means the bond of the family. Mothers tend to hold all things together. Amen? We're not under-emphasizing fathers. We talk often about the need for strong male leaders, spiritual leaders in their home. We need strong men in our church. We need strong biblical men in our country. But there is something special about mamas. That they bring a sense of nurture, a sense of love, and a sense of care that is desperately needed for any family, any church, and any nation. Mothers are often the grease and the glue that hold a family together. They're the ones who tend to keep us combined and connected. They're the ones who love us unconditionally. They're the ones that are the grease when there is issues, when there are problems. The mama can come in and solve those relational traumas. Mamas have a great spiritual gift and a spiritual calling. Mamas can also be tough, amen? Mamas can also lay the rod of education to the seat of knowledge. Mamas can often hold us accountable like nobody else can. Mamas can have the most tender heart, but they also have the most sternness that we do not want to disappoint them. We do not want to hurt them. We want our mothers to be proud of us. One rookie cop was asked, if you ever had to arrest your mama, what would you do? The young cop thought for a few moments and said, I'd have to call for backup. Amen. <laughs> Amen. 
Hey, I'm very aware that Mother's Day is not easy for everyone. Some folks are grieving today because their mother has died. I'm in that situation myself today, as is my wife. We have both buried both of our biological parents, moms and dads. You may be here today and grieving that reality on Mother's Day. Some moms are here grieving today because they have had the unfortunate responsibility of burying a child. Some are listening today who are grieving because they've experienced the trauma and the pain of an abortion. Maybe it was your choice or it was forced upon you, but that reality remains with you today. Some desperately want a mother to love them and to care for them and to connect with them, but for some reason your mother has not been able to do that that they've had their own life hurts and habits and hang-ups, and they have not shown you the kind of love that every person needs, regardless of their age and life. There are many here today who desperately want to be a mother, and they're unable to do so, whether it's by a physical condition, or a barrenness of the womb, or not yet have mentored into the right relationship. You feel that emptiness, the longing to have a child, but that blessing hasn't quite transpired in your life. Some of you are straining in your relationships. Mother versus child and child versus mother. There's been issues, there's been pain, there's been disappointment that you today feel in an acute way. Some are feeling regret from the absence in your child's life. That you can feel the pain knowing that you brought a child into this world and for whatever circumstances that you are facing, you have not been able to have that impact on that child that you long to have. Your situation may be different. You may be in a home where there are loveless situations where the child is rebellious and acting up and you're doing the very best you can. You would tell that child, I know that God loves you and I'm doing my very best. Amen. You're trying the best you can to love that child. You also may be a single mother here today and you have to carry that responsibility of both being the mother, the father, the protector, the provider, the spiritual covering. You are doing the job that God in His most perfect plan designed for two, a husband and a wife, a mother and a father to do, but you're carrying both of those responsibilities. Many of us here are not mothers and never will be become mothers because we're men. And surprise, surprise, men cannot have babies. Amen? I don't know why we'd even have to say that in this day and age, but I guess we do. Women have the gift from God to bring children into the world. Men do not have babies, but we all had a mother, so we all appreciate the gift of motherhood. A mama was putting her son to bed one evening. And it was on the eve of his fifth birthday. She was trying to communicate this birthday idea to him. So she said, Kevin, this is your last night of your fourth year. Do you understand that? Kevin was ready to communicate with his little hands. For a full year, he had shown people four fingers uh, for his four years. And now he was ready to add that most waited for thumb to those four fingers. Seeing his four fingers, his mother nodded and spoke, when you go to sleep tonight, you will be four years old, but do you know how old you'll be in the morning when you wake up? Kevin enthusiastically added his thumb to his four little fingers and said, tomorrow I'll be a handful. <laughs> Amen. If you are a parent, you understand that. Amen. When you are a parent, especially a mother, the days can seem so long, but the years seem so short. The days can seem at length, getting up early and all the responsibilities through the days. Often our children are never going to love us in the same level that we love them. Amen. They won't know the love of a parent until they become a child of them, or become a parent themselves. The days are long, never ending demands and responsibilities. Oh, but the years seem so short. 
Before you know it, your children, my boy, it's hard to even think about. He is 18 and coming up on his 19th birthday. My little girl now is 16 and driving a car. And it feels like just yesterday that they were just small little peanuts that I was holding on my shoulder and patting their little bottoms. Amen. So that you know, it just feels that way that you think you'll never get through the stressful season of life. But understand that every day is a gift from God. That as those children are in your home, this is your divinely appointed time to invest in them, to love them, to recognize the stress, but also to see the magnificent blessing attached to that. Well, today being Mother's Day, I'm going to look at a lady in the Bible. Her name is Lydia for a couple of very important things I want you to see from her life today. In your outline number one, let's look at the life of Lydia. The life of Lydia. Look at uh, verse 14. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. Us being the Apostle Paul and his ministry team. Just before this in chapter 16, you see the biblical account of the Macedonian call. That Paul was the world's greatest missionary. That he established many churches and took the gospel throughout the known world of his time. But as you know, the Apostle Paul wanted to go one direction and God said no. He wanted to go another direction God said no. And God gave him leadership by a vision of a man in Macedonia who was asking for Paul's help. He said that we are spiritually bankrupt in Macedonia. We could think of that today as Europe moving towards that area of the world from the Middle East heading towards Europe. And they said, we need you, Paul. Come here. And Paul obeyed. Paul obeyed the demand and the call from God used by this, uh, this man in a vision that called him to come. And as he went, he didn't find a man. He found a woman. He found a woman named Lydia. So kind of just a point of application. Whenever God seems like He answers our prayers in different ways than we anticipate, don't let that discourage you. Amen? That God is going to do things differently than you probably would do them. God was, uh, was not going to disappoint the Apostle Paul, but whenever Paul showed up, he was looking around for a man that called him, didn't find the man, but he found someone who was receptive, and her name was Lydia. We'll learn about her today. So A, under point one, she was a working woman. Verse 14 says that she was a seller of purple. That she was one who was industrious. She was one who worked. We don't know much about her family bio, uh, biography. We don't know if she was ever married. Maybe she was a widow. It doesn't say if she had children. It does talk about her household. That could have been other relatives. We just don't know all the details about her family. But what we know is this, that she was industrious and she had a work ethic and she was available to go and sell purple. Now, we know that purple in that day and time was a, uh, a hard color to make for the fabric of clothing. It was a long and difficult process. It was something that she had to learn as an apprentice. It was possible it was a family business, but somehow, someway, she is now leading this corporation. And today in our culture, the women have a very high demand. Some of you have the great privilege and honor of being a, a homemaker or a domestic engineer. Amen. My wife was able to stay home in the formative years of my children. God blessed me with a job that could provide for that. But that's not the case for all of you. Some of you ladies have to carry a responsibility within the home as well as in, within the workplace. And you feel like you're being stretched in two different directions to the max. Now I want you to know that if you are able as a mother to stay home and to raise your children, that is a holy and a good calling. If you are able to do that and someone asks you what you do vocationally, never just say, I'm only a homemaker. 
No, you are the greatest responsibility possible. Being able to invest in your children, training them up. You have a list of uh, expectations and qualifications that would surpass any CEO being able to lead your home. But some, uh, by choice, by calling, by default, you have to work in the workplace and yet your domestic responsibilities continue to remain the same. I applaud you. I recognize you. We learn here from Lydia that she was a woman who was not afraid of work. Amen? Uh, we have a day today where people seem to be allergic to work, right? No one wants to, nobody wants to put in some elbow grease. Everybody's a big fan of work. They can sit and watch it all day long, but they don't want to do it themselves. Well, every one of us are called by God to be able to be a, a hard worker. Amen? God says, whatever you put your hand to, do it with all of your might and all of your strength. If you get to stay home with your kids, give it your very best. Don't allow it to be secondary. Don't waste your days and waste your time on secondary things. Make sure you're focusing on those babies. If you work outside of the home, man or woman, make your place of employment your mission field. Have a shining testimony for God. Christians should be the very best employees that any business has. Amen? And if you are an employer or you are a boss or a supervisor or a CEO Christian, you should be the very best best leader that you can be. We lead with the character and the conviction of Jesus Christ. With well, this woman, she will work both within the home and outside of the home. There's just not enough hours in every day. It feels like our capacity is always being stretched. Our bandwidth is never wide enough to do everything that we're called to do. So that's why we need to be selective to be effective. Amen? We cannot do everything, but we want to make sure we recognize what God is calling us to do and to do that with the very best of our ability. Remind yourself of this. When you say yes to one thing, you have to say no to something else. And whenever you have small children in your home, young children, moms and dads, that's a season of life where we make some sacrifices. We may not be able to go golfing as much as we would like or fishing as much as we would like or work as many hours extra as we might like. There are going to have to be some things that we say no to so we can prioritize our greatest responsibility and those are the children that God has given to us. One church sign said it best. If evolution was true... How comes mothers only have two hands, right? If evolution was really true, evolution would have mothers with three or four hands to do all the work they have to do. But we recognize that God never gives us more than He empowers us to do. The problem is if we feel like we can't be a parent because we are too busy with life, we're probably taking on more than God's expected us to take on. Might be a time to evaluate yourself. Remember, there are seasons and reasons for everything. That you can't say yes to everything. You must be selective to be effective and make sure while your children are young, you are prioritizing them in your schedule. But make sure that you always, obviously, make sure you prioritize your marriage, first of all and most of all, even above your children. Amen? Amen. This is a mistake that many make. They find their identity in their child. It becomes so time-consuming for them. They've neglected their marriage. Well, guess what? Eventually, that child is supposed to leave the nest. They're supposed to leave the home. That they're not to just be a boomerang child and keep coming back. Amen? They need to go and make a life for themselves eventually. And that will leave you and your spouse now together. And many wake up after 18, 19 years of raising a child and finding their identity in a child. And they've forgotten about their spouse. And now all of a sudden they have a stranger they're living with. And know the exterior uh, uh, routines to follow. And it's a big wake up call. Make sure you're nurturing your relationship with your loved one while you're nurturing the parenting role for your children. B, she was also a wealthy woman. 
She was working and she was wealthy. Now here, don't let it pass by. There's a direct consequence. When you work, money comes involved. Amen? <laughs> money is a result of work. Some people complain about not having enough money or not being able to, to buy and do things, and yet they're taking the easy route when it comes to employment. They're expecting somebody else to do for them. But the Bible is clear about this. If a man does not work, he should not eat. The Bible says that we should work hard enough and be industrious enough that we have enough finances to meet our basic needs so that we can use the overflow to be a help and a blessing to others. That God wants us to use our wealth as a servant and not a master. This woman had wealth, but her wealth didn't have her. Amen? In verse 14 it says she was a seller of purple. As I said, purple was a hard color, a hard dye to make, to, to produce clothes. But color purple was also associated with royalty. They were the only ones who could afford such an expensive uh, merchandise. Lydia, Lydia apparently owned a, a spacious home as well. We'll learn that she opened it up to the missionaries with hospitality. So she was a wealthy woman. Now again, we don't know whether she had children or not, but there's a point of application here. Some people choose to not have children because they want to pursue the financial blessings of life. I want you to hear this, that children do not make rich people poor. They make poor people rich. Amen? Children in our life is a heritage from the Lord. The Bible says, blessed is a person who has their quiver full of children. My quiver got full after two, amen? But you might have 10 or 15, I don't know, you have as many kiddos as God wants to give you and as you want to have. The Bible does say count the cost though, amen? So hey, make sure that you have your wealth, not in financial things that are fleeting. Your wealth is making sure that you have a solid legacy, not just an inheritance to give to your kids. That they have known you, well, whether you are a single mom or a mom and a dad, that their kids know that you love Jesus, that you love them, that your faith is authentic and real, that they're getting the best of your life, not just the leftover. And they also recognize that you're trusting them to Him. You recognize just as that arrow in the quiver, it's there for a time. You pull it out, you draw it back, and you let it fly. It's God's desire for each one of us as parents. Our kids do not belong to us. They belong to God. We are simply stewards of them for a period of time. It's our job, our privilege, our responsibility to point them to Jesus and let them go. And if you do that, you will be wealthy in God's sight. See, she was a worshiping woman. She was a worshiping woman. It says in verse 14, Who worshipped God? Now where did she worship God? Down by the riverside. Why did she have to go down by the riverside? Apparently, there was no synagogue inside of this city. That was the normal routine for Paul. When he went to a city, he would find the place of worship, and he would go there to those who were receptive and open. But here in this community, in this area of Philippi, apparently when Paul arrived, there was no synagogue, so those who were seeking to know more about God, they went down by the riverside. Now, now tradition says for Jews that wherever there were ten God-fearing men in a colony, they would establish a synagogue. So when Paul arrives in Philippi, I'm sure he thought, Surely there's at least ten God-fearing men that have established a synagogue that could be my kind of tip of the spear in my missionary endeavors. He shows up and there is no synagogue. So apparently there was not even ten God-fearing men, but there was this God-fearing woman. And she did not allow the absence of a synagogue to prevent her from worshiping God. Let me ask you a question today. What external circumstances do you allow in your life that prevent you from serving and worshiping God? What things in your life have arisen that's caused you to be distracted from God's goodness and has stolen the song from your heart? 
We all talk about all the time here a theology of suffering. Life is hard. Life is difficult. It comes hard and fast. But don't allow those disappointments or those lacks of resource to prevent you from loving and serving God. You can find a way if you want to find a way. Amen? You can still love and serve God regardless of the circumstances. And apparently it's exactly what Lydia was doing. I want you to know this. Just believing in a God is not enough to be saved. Lydia was worshiping, it says, God. She was worshiping God, verses 14. So she knew there was a God. And the Bible tells us in Psalms, the fool says in their heart there is no God. The greater fool is the one who opens his mouth and says it. Amen? But the, the common sense is there's a God. There's a Creator. There's a Sustainer. She understood that, but we also know in James 2.19, even the devil and the demon knows there's a God. Mental assent and mental understanding and acknowledgement that there is some ambiguous God is not enough to save us. Lydia was religious. Lydia believed there was a God. She had a stirring in her heart, a desire to know truth, but she was not yet saved, terminology we use today, yet. But she's about to be. Amen? Just being religious is not enough to save us. We will learn in our sermon series, the book of Romans, as we walk the Romans road together. We will get to chapter 10 fairly soon. Romans 10 says this, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Friends, I want you to hear this. Religion is not what saves us. You can go to every church in town. You can give so much money, a church names a fellowship hall after you. You can be baptized so many times that tadpoles know your name. You can go through all the religious activities and not know God personally. One of Jesus' most profound statements where He says, You've honored Me with your lips, but your heart is far from Me. Depart from me, I never knew you. He was speaking to religious people. People went through the, all the external uh, accruements of religion. Now, this lady, I think her heart was right. She, she wanted to know the true and living God. There wasn't a strong witness in Philippi. There wasn't a synagogue. There wasn't a gathering of god fears. But God was still stirring in her heart. She allowed herself to be vulnerable. She went down by the riverside and she was praying. And I can assure you this, God hears all of our prayers. That God will make sure He will move heaven and hell if someone has a desire to be saved, to bring the Gospel to them so they'll have that opportunity. We see that right here. God was moving upon Lydia's heart. God was moving on the Apostle Paul's heart for a divine appointment to bring them together so that she could hear and say yes to Jesus. Just as religion and a knowledge of God doesn't save us, just praying in general does not save us. Matthew 6, 7 says this, When you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Some people don't have chants. Some people have a, a ritual. Some people have prayer beads. They go through all these things thinking that's what gains God's favor with them. God is more concerned with our heart condition than the words that come out of our mouth. Amen? Amen. That God, the first prayer that God really wants to hear any of us say is this, God save me, I'm a sinner. And then the rest of our prayers from that day forward is, God, show me what you want me to do, and I'm willing to do it. Amen? Amen. 
We have lots of things you want to pray about, but it can be boiled down to that. God, save me. I am a sinner. And God, help me know Your will so that I can do it. So then what does save us? If knowing God, knowing about a God, or going through religious activities, or even praying, they don't save us, what does? John 3.3 3 says this, I say to you, unless a man or a woman is born again, they cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless we are saved, unless we enter into the family of God, unless Jesus captivates our heart, unless we repent of our sin and turn to Jesus, unless there's a time where we enter into a personal relationship with Christ, we cannot be saved. Now some people say they're Christian, but they're not the born again kind of Christian. The problem with that is this. There's no other kind of Christian. Amen? <laughs> Born again is the only way to become a Christian. Born again means that we are born afresh, a new beginning, a clean slate spiritually by putting our belief, our trust, and our confidence upon Jesus Christ and not upon ourselves or anyone else or a church or a prayer or an academic education, but upon Jesus and Jesus alone. So we've looked at the life of Lydia. Now number two, let's look at the Lord of Lydia. The Lord of Lydia. A. Her experience of salvation. In verse 14 it says that Lydia heard us. She heard us. We learned just this past Wednesday night at Refuel Bible Study about the external call and the internal call of salvation. That this is God's divine way of bringing people into relationship with Him. That somebody is to proclaim the Gospel. Romans 10.14 says, How will they ever believe unless somebody tells them? Amen? Amen? So every one of us, if we are saved today, somebody communicated the Gospel to us. It was a book, it was a track, it was a TV evangelist, it was a pastor, it was a friend, it was a co-worker. Somebody shared the gospel with you. There was an external call, but that would not be enough unless there was also an internal call. An effective call where the Holy Spirit turns the light on inside of you where the Holy Spirit gives you the gift of grace, that He now expects you to exercise in obedience to Him, but the Holy Spirit is the one who does the convicting, the convincing, and the converting. So when it says Lydia heard, she heard both. She heard the Apostle Paul speaking the Gospel, and she also heard the Holy Spirit who's speaking from inside of her. Maybe you're here today on campus, or watching online, and you're hearing the Gospel maybe like never before. Maybe today you are hearing the Gospel from this preacher giving an external call that I'm asking you to come to follow Jesus, to love Jesus, to believe upon Him as your Savior and your Lord, but you're also sensing the internal call where the Holy Spirit is captivating your heart and your mind and claiming you for His self. If that is you today, right now between you and God, receive that gift of salvation. Right now between you and God, repent of your sin, put your faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. At the end of this sermon, we'll have a time of response. If that is your decision today, we would love to pray with you and encourage you and help you with that greatest decision you could ever make. John 5.24 says this, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. You've got to hear not only the external call, but the internal call. Verse 14 goes on to say this, after she heard us, heard the gospel, she then, the Lord opened her heart. Anyone who is saved did not save themselves. If you are saved here today, it's because God opened your heart. 
The Bible teaches us that we were running from God, not to God. He can run faster than us though. Amen? And He catches us and He brings awareness to us that we are sinners in need of a Savior. So as we said last week, we take no credit for our salvation, but God gets all the glory. Here's what John 6, 44 says, No man comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. You are drawn by God, hand selected by God. He tapped you on the shoulder and said, I love you. I want you. It's not because of anything good in you. We are loved because God has chosen to love us. Amen? And we get to respond to that good news by faith and obedience. This also reminds me, Lydia, how God was the one who made this truth and opened her heart. Reminds me of another account of Luke 24, 45. Those uh, disciples on the Emmaus Road where it says when Jesus walked with them, He opened their understanding. Their hearts were strangely warmed. There was something unique that happens when the Holy Spirit of God grabs a hold of you and you have that great aha moment. It's kind of amazing that we can hear the Gospel many different times, but all of a sudden there's something unique about this time. Some will say that on average people have to hear the Gospel at least seven times, if not more, before they finally say yes. Well, what's the difference? We have no idea. That's God's side of the equation. Amen? That, that is God's side of the equation to draw people to Himself in His timing and in His way. So church family, we pray for lost people. We need to pray that God will open their hearts. Amen? Do you pray that? We teach you that we want to pray for Bob evangelistically, right? You want to pray for a burden, an opportunity, and boldness. Inside of that, pray that when you have that burden and opportunity of boldness, that God will be preparing the hearts of those who you're going to speak with. One of my consistent prayers is, God, place me in contact with those who are open and receptive to the Gospel and help me to share the Gospel in clear and effective ways. That's just one of the prayers that I use. Find your own wording, but in your prayer life, you should be praying, God, Open the hearts of my family, my friends, my neighbors, my co-workers. God, I want to be the vessel that you use to share the gospel with them, but I'm unable to do it in my own strength. If you and I can talk somebody into loving Jesus, someone else can talk them out of it. Amen? But when the Holy Spirit of God convicts them and convinces them, and you simply get to be there on the journey, that's such a beautiful thing that will last for eternity. B, she's also, we want to see her evidence of salvation. Verse 14 goes on to say, after the Lord opened her heart, she heeded, or she did, the things spoken by the Apostle Paul. Elizabeth Elliot said this, The fact that I'm a woman does not make me a different kind of Christian, but the fact that I'm a Christian does make me a different kind of woman. Amen? Amen. Jesus makes the difference in our lives. If you are saved, there should, should be some evidence in your life. There is some heeding that takes place. If you look at your life, it has never changed. It's on the same trajectory. You may have had a, uh, an emotional experience. You may have said a prayer. You may have filled out a card. You may have walked an aisle, shook a hand, may have been baptized, may have joined a church, but if your life has never changed, you need to have grave concerns about your spiritual condition. But if you have trusted in Jesus, He has captivated your life, there's going to be a difference. Amen? God will give you a whole new set of want-tos. The things you used to want to do, you no longer want to do them in the same way. And the things that you wouldn't have wanted to do before, you now long to do because they please and honor the Lord. That's what happened for this good lady. Once she heard the Gospel, the Holy Spirit sealed it inside of her. She now had a desire to obey. 
We see some of those evidences in three practical things. We see, first of all, her baptism. Verse 15 says she got baptized. Her and her household. That means that not because she was saved and baptized, the family had to do the same. It meant that she, through her witness, led her family to Christ. Amen? Amen. Nobody should have a greater influence on your family than you do. May they see the difference in your life and may your family come to love and serve Jesus because of you. And baptism is our first major step of obedience after we have been saved. The baptism does not save you or keep you saved, but it shows the world that you are. We have a baptism coming up the first Saturday of this upcoming month. If you are saved, if you know Jesus, but you've never been baptized, here would be a great time for you. Let's begin to have that conversation. Before you leave today, let me know, or let Pastor Leon know. He'll be in the back. We want to help you prepare yourselves for that first major step of obedience as a follower of Jesus. Lydia was willing to do that. I have concerns about people who when they get saved, they don't get baptized. Now, I don't believe baptism saves them, but I think if you're saved, you'll do whatever God wants you to do. And the first thing is baptism. If you're following Jesus for any period of time, He's going to lead you to two places. He's going to lead you to the baptistry tank, and He's going to lead you to church. Amen? Those who say, I'm Christian, but I've never been baptized, don't really think I need church, you really need to have some concerns and some evaluation for where you are with Jesus. Kind of interesting when I think about this. Her baptism, she didn't have a baptistry to get in. Amen? She went where? Probably back to that same riverbank. Probably that same piece of property. She spent how many days praying and wanting God to show up in her life because there wasn't a synagogue in that same place. She had a testimony before all the watching world that she was not ashamed to be identified with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Not only her baptism, but her witness. And we said her whole household was baptized. That means she had a witness to her family. Now we know sometimes reaching our loved ones can be a challenge. Even Jesus had this problem. Remember He said a prophet is not without honor save in his own town, his own country. Hey, our family knows us best, right? Our, our siblings and our cousins and our parents and our kids, they know our shortcomings. But you know what? There can be great grace inside of that as well. When they see when you fail, but you rise up to apologize. When they see that you love them unconditionally, even when they're not being very lovable. They show that you have a forgiving spirit. They see that your whole life has changed. That you now have God at the center of everything you do. Those who know you best will see a great difference that Jesus makes in your life. It can do a mighty work drawing them to Christ as well. And lastly, hospitality. Her baptism, her witness, and her hospitality. She said, come to my house and stay. The Lord opened Lydia's heart, then Lydia opened her home. Friends, this woman, because she had a desire to follow Jesus, to heed Jesus, she wanted to open up all that she had, including her home, to invite the missionaries in. I believe probably others came into her home, and it became, they didn't have a synagogue, but guess what now? They had a church, and it was in Lydia's home. I love our model of our mission groups, amen? we got small groups that meet on Sunday nights in homes, very biblical model where we are loving and serving and growing and encouraging and ministering to one another. I love when you guys come to church on Sunday morning. If you didn't show up, I'd be disappointed. Preachers like to have someone to preach to. Amen? But I can tell you, sitting in rows listening to a sermon isn't where the depth of discipleship takes place. This is more for some inspiration, so we're together. But when you come into a small group, there's where your true spiritual steps of obedience take place. God wants you to have evidence of your salvation. God wants you to be a minister. God wants you to serve, to heed, to live a life that's pleasing and honoring to Him. We are truly partners with God. And we cannot do 
anything without God. There's many things God wants us to do in obedience to Him. Baptism, witnessing, hospitality, and many more. So today on Mother's Day, what is your next spiritual step of obedience? Do you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Are you hearing the external, the internal calls? Are you ready to say yes to Him? Maybe you're already saved. What is the next step of obedience as a follower of Jesus that you need to take? Maybe it's baptism. Maybe you want to learn how to share your faith. Maybe you want to join a mission group. Maybe you want to open your home to a lost person for the purpose of sharing the gospel with them. The church, we are here to help you think through, plan those out, encourage you so you can do the work that God has called you to do. Let's pray together.